Welcome in from your SUV, from your tractor or your ute, or maybe you're even riding your electric motorbike. But from wherever you are, you're with Alistair Moorhead and Glenn Judson, and this is The Alan Juddy Show. Well, what we want to do is reach out and provide you some technical information on a range of agricultural topics which may interest you. But to do it in a different way. Casual and comfortable format that allows you to listen where you want and when you want. This is intended for general information, and for more specific advice, contact your local Agricom rep. All right, in this particular episode, Alistair, what are we going to be talking about? Well, Glenn, we're going to be discussing one of nature's wee gems, which is the natural relationship between a fungus called endophyte and uh, perennial ryegrass, or ryegrass. And, uh, you know, what we're going to cover is, you know, what is an endophyte? Uh, We're going to cover, you know, what uh, are the critical um, advantages of having endophyte in different parts of the country and where it comes in. And we're going to discuss uh, some of the types of endophytes that Agricom work with inside their genetics. Um, And by the end of that, we'll probably touch on a couple of uh, other quirks of having uh, this relatively complicated system inside the New Zealand farming world. And uh, I think that would cover us uh, for what is quite a a technical topic. We'll try to keep it at quite a high level. Okay, cool. So um, I guess the first thing, um, and and we we hear this a lot in terms of where we're going to order seed um, and and the, the discussion about um, endophyte comes up. Um, let's 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 go really basic here and go. Um, what in fact is an endophyte, and what's the symbiotic relationship it has? Symbiotic. That's it. That's, that's what, the one. Um, what relationship does it have with the plant? Well, well, Glenn, it, it looks like it. Ryegrass, as it uh, as it escaped from the last ice age, travelled right across Europe from what was a very small area where it survived. And as it moved out across uh, Europe, particularly around the Mediterranean, uh, it obviously encountered more and more uh, uh, stressful situations, both in landscape types uh, and, and dry areas and, and different environments where there were a lot of different insect pressures. And it would appear at some point in, in some time uh, uh, a small fungus um, made it into ryegrass seed and uh, found a pretty happy place to live. And in doing that, uh, naturalised in ryegrass seed and formed a symbiotic relationship where, you know, um, I think you describe it really nicely, but uh, it's basically where one thing lives in with another thing which provides it with all its resources, but then it provides an advantage for its host. So it's a win-win situation. Yeah. So, so I guess what we're talking about here is this um, this fungus, which the the ryegrass plant um, gives, um, it hosts it, gives it a place to live, um, supplies it with nutrients, um, and and the symbiosis is in return. Um, this uh, fungus is producing some alkaloids, um, which give a level of protection against um, insect feeding or stress. and um, yeah. uh, stressful. Um, situations in in uh, potentially even um, grazing by herbivores, so, so so quite a strong. And you can see that from a evolutionary point of view, plants that um, are able to host these particularly uh, um, endophytes probably have an advantage. And uh, as um, as we move into stressful situations, and we have more bugs and, and more grazing um, uh, herbivores. Absolutely. And so you know the the history of endophyte in New Zealand fundamentally is that a lot of our seed came from um, uh, UK and. Uh, in the early days of uh, planting our, our ryegrass landscape, and it would appear that we introduced only one endophyte. Now, getting back to what is endophyte, though, is that it is a small fungus that lives intercellular in the basal area of a ryegrass plant, and it carries out its life cycle by living in the basal area of the plant, and as the as a ryegrass plant goes to um, its reproductive phase, puts up a seed head and creates its um, seed, uh, the, the endophyte mobilizers travels up the stem and colonizes the new generation of seed. Now, it's a living organism, and if that endophyte ever dies, 
it can never be reintroduced naturally. It can be, you know, we've discovered technology for inoculating um, plants that don't have endophyte, and I'll explain that shortly, but the reality is uh, it's a living organism. It is either in the plant or it's not, and when it's not, it cannot come in from any other way other than than this natural process of moving from an, a fully infected plant up the stem into the new generation of seed so, and into so the next to, cycle. So just to clarify, it doesn't come through pollen. It doesn't come through pollen and it cannot move through the soil into the plant. So it's quite an important uh, acknowledgement. It's a, a living uh, combination and, and really has to be, because of that, it's actually a little bit complicated in looking after it and making sure it does work properly. The biological system of it moving into the seed, living in the seed, moving out into the next generation is actually a biological system that we have to work with quite closely in this eight day and age. And I guess um, the, the other bit that's probably, and, and you're probably going to come to this, but to point this out is that we talk about endophyte as, as a as a singular thing, but but actually there are a number of different types of endophyte. And, and that's exactly what I was getting on to, Glenn, because when we got our original seed lines out of the UK, only one endophyte made it to New Zealand. And that endophyte we describe as um, uh, uh, a standard endophyte or a traditional endophyte. And there's a few alkaloids in these plants. And in this particular endophyte that colonised all of New Zealand up until the mid-90s, in every grassland in New Zealand, uh, uh, had uh, the alkaloids pyramine, lolotrim B and ergovalene. And we'll we'll touch on what some of these different alkaloids mean later. But this is the... The uh, discovery of endophyte in New Zealand is only as recent as the late 70s, early 80s, and it was almost by accident. And that's a story for another day with a uh, slightly older person than myself. But it is really fascinating that it's actually a recent discovery. And then for all the 80s and and, and during the end of the 80s, there was discoveries that n- around the world, not all the endophytes were the same. Now, this was important because in this old traditional standard endophyte, it's the same endophyte that still exists in the variety Nui, and it's part of part of its population. Half of its seed mostly has no endophyte, but some of the seeds still have this particular style. And that is, um, it creates um, some of those alkaloids, particularly, particularly Lolotrim B, is a mammalian toxin and can create staggers, dags, and a few things during the summer with very high levels of ergovalene create animal health um, and ill thrift through the summertime. Now, we faced this throughout all of New Zealand up until the mid-90s. But in the late 80s, uh, in mid-80s to late 80s, ag research particularly discovered that this was not the only endophyte that existed in ryegrass around the world. And they tracked a, a large number of different styles that produced different l- amounts of el- alkaloid. And uh, the discovery of novel endophytes uh, um, came about pretty much through the end of the uh, or early 1990s, with the first new endophyte being commercialised, which uh, in 2000, which was AR1, which was the first what you would describe as fully animal safe endophyte, and the alkaloids that only affected insects were the ones there and the one that and it didn't produce the alkaloids that affected the animals. And I think I can remember, um, I can actually remember the release of that and there was a lot of excitement around the fact that um, we now had an, an endophyte that um, provided some protection we, and we came later to discover that it wasn't a full protection but it, it gave um, partial protection of, to the plant but actually uh, almost none of the downsides of, of the standard endophyte from an animal perspective. Correct. So it was exciting in the fact that we we now had a, a safe end to fight for Correct. animals. And, and we did learn of things, like you just said, you know, when you take out all the protection me- mechanisms from the animal, it means as a farmer, you have to up your management because you have to now be careful with your grazing residuals, whereas before the alkaloids and the base of the ryegrass plant were protecting the plant from you overgrazing with your animals. They started to stagger, and therefore you stopped grazing so hard under dry conditions. Now, once that protection was removed, it the onus came back onto you as a, a a farmer and a farm manager to not overgraze your pasture, not overgraze your pasture during droughts or stress. 
And so that's where some of the uh, the AR1 end of fight in more stressful environments actually started to struggle with persistence because once we took away one of its true protection mechanisms, it became all about you and your management and individually, you know, as I've commonly said, is you know, I want to try and find as many combinations where we don't have to manage specially. Uh, but when it comes to overgrazing and stressful conditions, it's always been an advantage if the plant protected itself. And when we remove that, it's up to you to protect the plant. And sometimes you're stressed and you don't always get it right. And therefore you overgraze and next thing you're in a declining situation. So that was the emergence of novel endophytes. Um, but the endophyte story is unique to New Zealand. And it's because we're an island. And because we're an island, uh, an island nation, and quite remote, and most of these things are introduced, uh, what has actually happened is the pasture pests that have come into New Zealand over time have absolutely thrived in our temperate environments. And this is the reason endophyte means more to New Zealand than virtually anywhere else in the world. One, ryegrass is just that important for the New Zealand economy. It's worth, I, I believe it's worth close to $14 billion of, of economic um, uh, return to the New Zealand economy can be attributed to ryegrass-based pastures and ryegrass, ryegrasses. So it is a, a, it is a really important uh, uh, species. However, because we're an island, when the pasture pests have either the, the, some of the native insects that have adapted to eating ryegrass really successfully or introduced pasture pests have come without their, their controls, suddenly endophyte has become more important in New Zealand to anywhere else in the world and, so, so, and it's become a really interesting. So that's a really important point. I guess if we look from a, a New Zealand centric point of view, yeah. you know, we have always had endophyte, whether it be standard endophyte or now or some of these novel endophytes, but um, actually, that's quite unique in the world. And if we travel Correct. to other um, countries in terms of their agricultural industry, endophyte is not something that they are familiar with. No, because the pests that have travelled to New Zealand um, have no natural biological controls, but in their homelands, they have multiple controls. So they never form these massive populations that can devastate pasture. Whereas over here, when they have no natural control processes, they can build to levels pretty much unseen anywhere else in the world and therefore actually anything that provides an advantage to the plant is uh, is gold, it's particularly when you're trying to develop a sort of resilient and partially persist, you know, a, a persistent system. So, so, it's a so big, it's a big driver to true success. So, so we get to the point now where we've got this AR1 and um, we've got a complete animal um, safety. Um, and and uh, as long as we are managing it well, um, we're able to get um, some persistence out of that. Um, what what happens next? Well, um, from our perspective, another endophyte emerged in our world uh, in the '90s, and uh, we didn't even know what was creating the the changes in the plots, and this shows you how new endophyte is, but this endophyte existed. It had a new set of chemistry. We've mentioned alkaloids, pyramine, lolitrin B, and ergovalene, which are, are common pathways in a lot of the endophytes we work with, uh, and the novel endophytes are of the same, uh, just sort of genetic base, and they just have pathways that don't complete and don't become the final alkaloid. Uh, but a, a completely new uh, alkaloid emerged that we didn't know what it was, didn't know what it meant. We didn't know a lot about it until plots in the 90s were starting to be seen in dry environments that were completely green while the, all the rest of the plots in the... And, and yeah. really interesting, um, the fact that it got overlooked was because a lot of the researchers were looking for those normal alkaloids. Correct. And Correct. because it was low in those or had, had, almost had none of them, had none yeah. of them that, that plant was overlooked. Whereas or we the, just didn't know what it meant. Yeah, but in the plots... Um, when we started growing this, these were outstanding. And, and, and so I guess um, that led to the discovery of some of these um, intermediate uh, um, alkaloids, not the full pathway, but some well, of Well, the epoxygenthrum is a completely different uh, alkaloid profile, with a, and so it's a completely different uh, scenario. But the point being is AR37 emerged out of that discovery, and that is a completely different alkaloid that protects itself in the plant, and it's a, a group of epoxygenthrums. So the key really here is that uh, what made the point is what what made the plot green, and it was the alkaloids that were there impacting a pasture pest that we didn't even acknowledge at that time. So here's an example where something as recent as the 90s, there is a pasture pest that feeds on the roots of ryegrasses 
that we weren't even acknowledging as a pasture pest. And what's that? That was called root aphid. So yeah. root aphid's a robber. It robs the plant of energy, like an aphid on a rose, aphid on your vegetables, aphids on your, uh, your crops. Um, it is sucking a plant under stress. And in this case, there are aphids in your roots of your pasture. And the reality is, uh, it turned out the epoxy jantrums were very good at, at, at protecting against root aphid, which creates this greening in summertime where aphids are obviously putting a lot of pressure on the root structures. So that leads really to the group of insects that endophytes can impact in New Zealand because, as I said, you can't talk about why endophytes are important without acknowledging New Zealand's really special for the, the very destructive pests for the survival of ryegrass. And so, for example, in the, the warmer winter environments of New Zealand, which the area is spreading, of course, with the, the, the slow um, climate change, um, but uh, African black beetle has found a home in the north of New Zealand and slowly down the coast um, of the west coast of uh, the North Island and um, parts of it's moving slowly into the Hawke's Bay and there's a, even small populations up in the sort of Golden Bay area of the South Island and that pasture pest is quite devastating for the perennality of, of ryegrass partly because um, the only mechanism we have to protect the ryegrass is to have the alkaloids present that stop the female black beetle from staying in your paddock. So if it eats eats the leaf of a plant infected with endophyte and the right endophytes with the right alkaloids, that black beetle will say, I, I can't be here. This is not what I want to eat. I don't want to stay here. And it moves on. It goes and infests another paddock, possibly an annual ryegrass paddock or a, a paddock, where the endophyte doesn't match the pest, in this case um, African black beetle, and uh, she is able to eat. But once she lays eggs in the paddock, no endophyte is able to, compl- uh, perennial ryegrass endophyte is able to protect the roots of perennial ryegrass from the very large larvae that come um in the larval phase of the black beetle. So it's a very devastating pest. The adult is quite devastating on establishing new pasture, but the, the larvae can wipe out anything. So, so the best mechanism we have is to uh, tell the female to go away and go and find something else to eat. There's a common theme here because that's a trait that um, endophyte does a lot. It's, it, it tends to try to be a feeding deterrent and therefore um, reduce the amount of egg that's being laid. Correct, yep. correct. And so the other big pasture pest that does that, and AR1 is a really good example of this, is Argentine stem weevil. And if you if and the weevil itself can only destroy tiny seedlings, and, and that the adult weevil is a pest of establishing pasture. The la- once established the adult weevil can't really damage. It's too small to damage the fo- foliage enough of a perennial ryegrass plant to destroy it. However, it lays its eggs in the tillers of ryegrass plants. And that's what's called Argentine stem weevil. The larvae tiller and bore through the tillers and they actually kill the tillers. And of course, multiple leaves are formed from the tillers and then they just die. Basically, the central leaf turns brown, there's a hole in the bottom and it's physically chiseled out the inside. Technically, they need about four tillers to go through its life cycle. And and so um, while that adult is unlikely to be able to damage an establishing pasture. An, an established pasture. Yeah. So the um the, the larvae are certainly oh, able devastating. To, 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 um particularly young pastures. Yeah. So what's really interesting is AR1 is very good for Argentine stem weevil. It's not good for African black beetle. Very good for Argentine stem weevil. However, AR37 has a different mechanism for Argentine stem weevil in that it doesn't deter the female. So AR1 deters the female, she goes away and lays in a paddock of Italian ryegrass. Um, AR37, she doesn't um, get deterred at all, and she lays her eggs in AR37-based pastures. However, the alkaloids that are cycling with AR37 kill the larvae. So before they can physically damage the tiller as a young larvae just emerging, trying to chew into it, they're, they're killed. So it's a really effective mechanism for absorbing a lot of eggs in a population and then killing the, the larvae. And it's quite a good uh, integrated pest management almost for winding down Argentine stem weevil using the 37 endophyte. Uh, then we've got other um, insects that are, are big players, and one of them is Perina. Uh, that is a native moth that flies into pastures with high cover, lays its eggs, and those uh, caterpillars are developing through autumn into into winter, and some of the late flights all the way in through to August, September. Now, um, 
knowing the fights really protect against those to any degree other than AR-37. And AR-37 is not a complete protection against Piranha, but can protect very effectively against the flights that hatch in autumn and create damage in May and June. Um, the alkaloids are still in high enough amounts in that late autumn phase when the larvae are small that they are quite toxic to those larvae and it can really reduce the damage of Piranha in that window of time. However, some of those uh, species of Piranha lay quite late. They hatch very late and the environment's much cooler and the alkaloid levels are lower and they're far less effective at controlling it. But as far as Piranha goes, 37 is the most effective endophyte for controlling that insect pest. After that, it gets really tough because some of those three I've just described are the big three for truly destroying pasture. We've discussed the root aphid, which is just a robber of dry matter production at times of stress. So having resilience during times of stress is still highly attractive, and that's what makes AR-37 quite special in summer conditions and uh, that. Um, uh, but one of the big ticket items that ryegrass has never been able to be tolerant of is uh, the native New Zealand grass scrub. And that is another very big ticket um, insect pest, which currently there is no perennial ryegrass based endophytes to tolerate that. So so, so just on that, and, and, and probably just stretching a little bit outside endophyte, if you were in, um, you know, in big ryegrass, uh, grass scrub zones, what what's, what's, something that you can do that might help that situation obviously you said there's nothing we can do in the endophytes yeah. um what what is is there anything that we can do in terms of maybe species selection or yes. or or management what's the, what what are the um in, in terms of um some some hope in, in those grass scrub zones well because we're talking about endophyte and perennial rye or rye grass um it's it's there's not actually a lot of hope it's been a, it's been a definitely a massive target of the industry to find a solution in such a flexible species, a, a, a highly nutritious plant that grows in autumn and winter and can take a lot of different managements and is described as very very user friendly. Um, there's no easy answer to, to grass scrub that's been going to be solved in the short term by endophyte in perennial ryegrass. Um, Glenn, to answer that, really we are stepping out of this conversation and heading towards the world of tall fescue, uh, particularly tall fescue. And in recent times, um, Agricom has uh, started commercialising a meadow fescue and meadow fescue has um, uh, an end fight that's moderately, you know, quite functional when it comes to grass scrub. But meadow fescue itself is not a complete grass. It is probably not capable of being a driver of a farm system by itself. Only grows about 70 Five percent of what a perennial ryegrass can. It's got really weak shoulders. Through the winter, it's dormant. Um, uh, uh, so, and, and it likes high fertility situations. There's other things that drive its success other than grass scrub. So, we've got some mechanisms there to go to. They are actually always been here. And if someone's desperate enough to try tall fescue, and in recent times, Agricom's been testing the tall fescue meadow fescue mixes, and we believe you know they are an intermediate. A scenario where you've got resilient pastures that can be managed easier because meadow fescue is high quality and helps grazing management. Uh, they are a little bit of a solution, but not really in the ryegrass world. There's yeah, not a, not a lot in that space. But I think it's important to to to, to um, discuss that because yeah. I think you're right in terms of the ryegrass space. Um, it's likely we're going to have to get outside of the ryegrass Correct. species to really have any hope in terms of um, even going partially way to. And there'll be a lot of industry people listening and farmers that are listening today that know they get grass scrub every year and know that sometime in their careers they have been told that fescues um, are one of the solutions to re more resilience in a grass scrub environment but ryegrasses are so easy yeah. so we like to bag them yeah. and we like to do all this but you still don't want to change your system enough to move to probably a more resilient species in those systems so it is it is a bit of a call out for people to just be aware um, that we can talk about grass scrub as this um, really difficult problem 
but it's not so difficult that I want to make my farm system complicated to by using su- to use something more resilient. Yeah. So, yeah, I suppose that's a little bit of a call out in that discussion. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, we're trying to clarify here that there's nothing simple as a solution when it comes to ryegrass. Absolutely. And, and, and I guess um, we could pull the discussion sort of together and, and now think about this from a farm systems point of view and say, um, let, let's have a discussion about um, the different end of that we've talked about and and how we might use them in different parts of the country yeah, and absolutely. under different grazing um, or in different farm yeah. systems. So so um, how, how, do we, how do we go in the Upper North Island, for example? Well, for starters, you know, we see AR37 in our portfolio as our premium endophyte. It's, it's the endophyte that gives more resilience to grass in literally every location in the country. Um, however, it, you know, AR37 is not perfect in its own right, and therefore there's still a place for AR1 and finishing systems with stock that are susceptible to stagger risk profiles or high-value stock in that space. However, as you uh, look across the country, wherever you have black beetle and light friable soils, uh, AR1 is quite a risk profile because black beetle uh, adults can eat AR1 and lay eggs with an AR1 pasture. On heavy soils, you can actually almost get away from it, but on lighter soils of the Waikato and parts of Northland, African black beetle um, really limits the use of AR1 in those environments. AR37 is a, you know, a, a really well-suited endophyte to the north. As you drift south into colder environments where African black beetle is not around as much. Then you start to ask the question about your stock classes, your belief in resilience, and you want to put more of the, 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 um, you know, uh, more of the resilience from having a stronger end of fight, or do you want to have a, a, a lamb finishing pasture where you don't ever want to think about may I get staggers one year and five, which is a little bit of the risk profile with an AR thirty seven, so. AR37 single singular risk really is uh, the potential for staggers. Relative to the history of ryegrass staggers in the country, it's very minor. And in all my experience to date, the only occasions I have seen staggers be really effective on on people's farms is under extreme stress where the pasture is staying green. It is the target pasture to be grazing because it is the most resilient. But because the stress is so high, all the white clover has disappeared from the pasture. And by the time we get to have the discussion around a stagger event, you tend to find it's mostly a pure stand. Never sown as a pure stand, but because of the stresses of the environment have ended up a pure stand. So we don't tend to see staggers in AR37 ever occur when you're in a diverse mixture, be it with chicory, plantain, coxfit, and the clovers. However, as I've just described, many of the clovers get stripped out during stress. And so if you're in a hot, dry environment like the wire wrapper and a drought time, Hawke's Bay, North Canterbury, quite regularly, by the time you get to the point where you may one day see in a singular paddock create a problem, uh, you may find that there's literally nothing growing in that paddock apart from the ryegrass and it is the greenest paddock on your farm. Therefore, you're putting the animals on the most successful paddock on your farm, and that's where the risk profile can be. But all in all, um, in that same situation, AR1 may have just die. Yes. Because you'll be overgrazing it in the same stressful environment and overgrazing it to such a point that it may not recover. And that's what we found in the early 2000s when that was first introduced. As soon as the North Canterbury's of the world got droughts, AR1 pastures resilience came into real question because they were being overgrazed quite intensively. So in, in, um, in a high, um, you know, in summer safe um, uh um, high rainfall areas, you know, parts of Southland. Yep. Um, uh, you know, uh, there was a thought um, uh, previously that there was no need for endophyte correct, down there. Correct, correct. I mean, yeah. the standard endophyte created a real problem that was blamed for so many different things, and it was quite negative. It, I mean, you don't have an endophyte that can contribute to an animal outcome called summer ill thrift without not being great. Yep. Um, so the move away from endophyte, and endophyte is a dirty word, really, really rolled out of the 80s and the 90s. So it was a big deal that if you don't didn't think you needed endophyte, shouldn't have it. you shouldn't have it, which we killed the endophytes within our, our seed, which meant that the plants that were growing were growing without the natural relationship with the 
endophytic fungus. And these we called low endophyte or nil endophyte plants. And there are a few parts of the country that can actually get tolerate that today. The west coast of the South Island and definitely some parts of Southland uh, without question still use quite a large amounts of low endophyte pasture. However, the risk profile has just been emerging constantly as we all experience this uh, warmer winter conditions, including the south, believe it or not. Um, but the reality is that is releasing pasture pest and pest cycles in areas you weren't expecting. And so, for example, Argentine stem weevil, which devastates low endophyte pasture, destroys it, can be, it can be there one minute, literally gone the next, um, is moving further into different parts of Southland now. Uh, likewise, on the coast, um, you'll have pockets of different insects that actually can colonise and, and do become destructive. So what we were perceived to be safe with more knowledge, we recognise that some of the losses and some of the damage are because we haven't got protection. So AR1 for the south is a, you know, a quite a successful endophyte and, and it's a good choice endophyte. But then also in the same climates you've just described, um, Perina is another one of those pasture pests. So therefore you've got the AR37, even in a in an area that is not the stem weevil that's the primary, but Perina could be your your target, and AR37 is a good endophyte for that. So I guess um, if we were looking at um, kind of uh, at a high level, um, the choice of endophyte that you make um, is really dependent not only on the, the system that you're driving from an animal point of view, but probably more importantly about the pests that you are going to encounter um, and and the way that they um, control those um, uh, in, in terms of making the, you know. Absolutely, and, and that's exactly right. And that's why being aware, acknowledging what you're experiencing and, uh, and listening to people when they say your pasture has just died because of this, well, what endophytes could I have done that could have made that more resilient? Um, knowing your farm fit for the style of endophyte, like for example, a classic uh, statement we would make is you do not put AR37 endophyte behind deer fencing because the risk of staggers with deer is so much more complicated and so much uh, worse. So we do not recommend AR37 for deer. And, uh, and then logically, that's an absolute choice of AR1, which is an animal safe end to fight for that particular stock class. So they are the sort of processes we go through. And, and just because a deer fence, for example, um, has no deer behind it today, once you pass a plant of perennial pasture, you want to make sure you've really recognised that you're unlikely to see it restocked at a later date and create a problem. So as an industry person or a farmer, you need to think about not just now, but what may be going on in the future. Excellent. Oh, well, uh, listen, I'm uh, off to check my deer. Um, I've got a few out in the back paddock, so um, I might just go and make sure that they're, uh, they're all in the upright position. Well, that's good, Jody. But just before you go, I'll just summarise what we've just covered. And uh, basically, you know, when we look at what endophyte means to New Zealand, New Zealand's quite a special place. We've identified that when a lot of insects arrived in New Zealand, they didn't bring their natural predators or, or parasites that control their populations. So in our temperate environment, most of them have thrived. What that has highlighted is that endophyte has been a very special thing once it was discovered for New Zealand pastoral systems, particularly based on ryegrass. We identify this as a living fungus that has evolved with ryegrass to give it advantages in stressful conditions. And we've identified how that passes on through the generations via the seed and that it's a living organism that we must look after for it to be there in the seed in the future um, and, and colonise future plants. We've discussed those insects we found in New Zealand to be quite damaging and destructive. And I actually found that there was a really uh, good summary of, of the key pasture pests and how um, those different endophytes um, affect those. Yes, and and, they're not, and, and they're, some of them are quite regional. Um, and then we've also just touched on... If few of the farm systems and the regional spread of what you might consider when you're discussing and looking at endophytes in your pasture. All I can say is that it is a, an awesome symbiotic relationship and it'd be so cool in ag classes around the country if this sort of relationship was discussed because it is very interesting as well. So that would sum up that uh, topic really nicely. That was done at quite a high level. A lot more detail behind all of that as I, I assume some of you may have picked up on. But uh, hopefully that gave some interesting insight into what Endified is in New Zealand ryegrass pastures. Thanks, Ellie. See you next time. See you, Jody. Have It is not advisable to mix AR1 and AR37 endophytes.
AR37 is only suitable for sheep and cattle and not advised for deer or horses.